thank you again, and thank you for your patience. Staying, on, staying here, you should get an award for staying until late in the afternoon. I'll try to uh, make it lively to finish things off here. I'm a former official. My career in government um, is about half of my adult life. I've worked on national security and foreign policy issues. Eight years in the Pentagon. I've worked in the White House, uh, many jobs in the State Department as an appointee, which means uh, when you're in, it's a very wonderful uh, experience. When you're out, you have to clear out your file and leave <laughs> and, and wait for the next people. So um, it's been my privilege to work in five previous administrations. And frankly, uh, the last time I came in, the, the president made me a special envoy with the rank of ambassador. The funny thing about these jobs is that the title only lasts for a certain amount of time. And that's true of a military rank, an admiral or a general is, uh, serves in that capacity for a while, but then it ends and they retire. But even if you have a wire brush, you can't scratch it off of them. They still carry that title general for the rest of their life, and it's also true of ambassador. So the, what I have learned from that is that when you, have an, when you have a nice title, you can go overseas and you will be received graciously by important people. But, but now that I'm not in the government, when I go overseas, I, I see all the other people who are helpful. They're, they're the people who are working. I go to the Middle East a lot. You see people from South Asia, Southeast Asia, Eastern Europe, uh, Africa. They've come from so many places, and it's, it's always my joy to talk to them and find out what their story is. And they may be young people, and what do they want to do with their lives? Uh, and what I took away from the honor of being called ambassador is that now it's really a small a ambassador. In other words, they, they look at me and say, is he Canadian, is he Dutch, is he German? And when they realize, no, he's American, they're probably thinking, well, is he very arrogant? Is he, he doesn't even know I'm here driving him for an hour. And, and I make a point of trying to connect with people because I really am interested in their future. It's part of the learning about foreign affairs. But it's also true that those people will judge an American who they're spending time with much more than they will judge an American over social media or over satellite television. And I think that's the big lesson that I've learned is that human contact is really much, much, much more powerful than distant images. So that's what I want to talk about today. I've learned really two lessons in government. One is that influence is the coin of the realm and trust, has, as Alan just said. But it's not just a function of how strong a country is. How, how much of a military you have, how big is your GDP, that's not influence. People will resist a strong power as much as they will cooperate, depending on how they feel about it. And the second is what I've just said, which is that people-to-people -people interaction is, 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 is very vital, and it reveals the culture and the values of a person in a way that no medium, no slideshow, no television or online broadcast can possibly do. So it's really made me think about the struggle for a better world, if, you, if I could use that definition for geopolitics in the 21st century. Yep. It starts with the question, we have a term called hard power. We talk about soft power and hard power. What is power? And you might think when you hear the term power, United States, that this may be the kind of image that comes to mind, a traditional concept, the legacy of great power conflicts and the major wars of the 20th century. This is, this is how you get the term superpower. And you know, the United, United States still uh, follows a fundamental concept of international affairs, as, does, as do many countries. They, they, they think in terms of military strength um, as being a core of their identity as nations in the world. But the world is changing. Now, I had a boss in the Pentagon in the 1980s. Uh, we traveled to a lot of countries. He did all the talking. He was very charismatic and strong. Uh, I took the notes and was the only, and I just tried to make sure that uh, everything was in order. And we used to make defense arrangements all around the world. And he was a great diplomat and went on to much higher office. One time he got in the car and he said, you know, all this new democracy, <laughs> All the, the fall of the autocrats in, around the world. He said it, it was so much easier when you could just go in and get a yes answer from a king or a dictator in one meeting. <laughs> he, was, he was joking. 
he was pointing out that the world was changing, that even dictatorships uh, have to listen to their people, that, uh, that, that the people have a voice, whether or not it's a formal voice or not, the world is changing. And so the democratization of the street is very important. So when you get to a major issue of international affairs, the question is, who else is raising their hand? And why are they raising their hand? Are they just listening to the king? Are they just listening to the dictator? Yes, in some cases that's all, that's the only vote that counts. But sometimes the street now has much more of a vote than ever. So whether a country is a democracy or a dictatorship or anything in between, public opinion matters. And I could have put so many pictures uh, around on this issue of worldwide competition uh, for influence. But we are obviously citing Russia and China as the military and economic competitors, uh, strategic competitors in this century. And I think uh, the beliefs and aspirations of their people will matter just as much as the opinions of, of the elected leaders themselves. I want to show you another slide. Let me see if I can find it. There we go. There are so many different countries where this kind of a photograph has been seen recently. I just picked a few. That's Tahrir Square, Iran, in the last couple of months. Florida, last week after the shooting. But we could say Caracas, Venezuela, Hong Kong. We could say the Maidan in Kiev, Ukraine a few years ago. We could say Kuala Lumpur when there was a crisis of uh, possible corruption. People took to the streets. And they take to the streets in places and many others whether or not there is a very strong uh, repressive government. They're, they, they, will, they are defying uh, their government. This is what happened in the Arab Spring. It's what happened in Iran. And I think with these teenagers, they're supposed to be in school obeying the adults. But no, they were out on the streets saying no to the adults. A, a very revolutionary moment, uh, even for the United States. So public opinion certainly matters. And the question is, what do we stand for? Now that has always mattered. American values were a little bit easier to understand when uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt could get on the radio and there was one voice coming from the United States and everyone heard the voice. Or when John F. Kennedy was sworn into office in 1961 and gave his inaugural address that, that really had a transformative uh, v value in terms of the youth and image and aspirational uh, profile of the United States. Uh, today, America speaks with a million voices, and they go through many different channels. So the question is, what do we stand for? And yet, I think that that question matters more today than it ever did. Now, the US has, has always stood, and I'll just speak about my country, for traditional values. Uh, we like to say that we are a democracy and support democratic governance. These, unfortunately, it's such a contentious idea of democracy. You're allowed to disagree. So we fight over whether we are being democratic enough. We fight over whether we are promoting democracy overseas or whether we are suppressing it. Uh, but this is something that the US has identified with. I'll just say I, I personally have, have been a little bit concerned that even my colleagues in government are often confused about what a democracy is. We witness balloting and we say, congratulations, they voted in a new leader in a certain country. Uh, I mean, they will vote in Xi Jinping at the next uh, party congress as the undisputed sole leader of a, a single party system. Uh, Iran has had many elections. They've been controversial. Um, are, is that democratic when only five out of 868 candidates are allowed on the ballot? Some would say probably not. And so. The question, I will just say that my definition of democracy is this. It is whether the rights of all people in the society are, are reliably upheld. If everyone's rights are upheld, I find that that is the best definition for democracy. Speaking of upholding rights, justice, which is the most ancient and central concept, I think, in civilization. People know what justice is. They can't define it. But everybody knows when something isn't right. Everyone knows when something wasn't on the level. Uh, people don't have to be educated to understand what justice is. 
It's basically fairness and right and wrong. So is the United States, speaking for my country, standing for justice? I would argue it's probably the single most important element of foreign policy, and sometimes our leaders uh, aren't really clear on how important justice is. Because where there is no justice, people ultimately will not accept their rulers. And of course the US has been very involved in upholding security. I have a picture of the blue helmets. Yes, there's a lot of debate in Washington about the United Nations, but they still pay a fairly large amount of the bill, and we have great respect for the work of so many UN agencies and institutions. So I think that the American people, regardless of what you may hear, uh, have a, a deep appreciation for the importance of the United Nations as an institution acting on behalf of the member states. So that's another area where the United States uh, has stood for security, and we've worked with countries all over the world. In my career, I've been to close to 100 countries, and I know a lot about security relationships, um, which can be very informal, and can be, uh, it's not always about military matters, it's about the integrity of the state. It's very important. So we stood for democracy and justice and security. But when we talk, we think about soft power, what are we talking about? What is soft power? Is this some, something entirely irrelevant to justice and security and democracy? Um, we, the first answer when we say, what is soft power is, well, it's arts, it's literature, it's sports. But there's, a, there's an expression that I heard when Alan Larson and I served together under Colin Powell. We had a colleague from Madison Avenue, which is the traditional home of advertising on, in New York City. And this uh, undersecretary said that there's an there's a old adage in, on Madison Avenue. It says, it's not what I said, it's what you heard. And that's the key to advertising. It doesn't matter what you said, it's what did the customer hear? What did they think? How did they feel? And, and the key to successful projection is the result, not the output. So my experience is that engaging people in ways that directly impact their future, their hope, and their aspirations is extremely powerful indeed. Now, this is a picture of uh, Princess Diana. Uh, many years ago, a friend of mine from my hometown in Massachusetts who had traveled overseas and stepped on a landmine as a college student camping, uh, eventually met another young American who had lost both his legs while driving a Jeep delivering assistance in Somalia. The two of them formed the Landmine Survivors Network, which went on to share in the Nobel Prize, which took Princess Diana to Bosnia, uh, one month before she was tragically killed in an accident. Uh, Queen Noor of Jordan became the patroness after that. So for years, we worked with people who had had a traumatic injury in, in networks around the world. Uh, and this was the most personal of connections. We created companies where landmine victims could make fishing hooks and sell them in Vietnam, or could create uh, small greenhouses for tomatoes in, in the Balkans. And the only rule was, uh, before you do anything for yourself, you have to give something back to society, which for a trauma victim is a hard thing to do. They think they're the victim. But by the end, the key of survivorship was, you have to be strong, as strong or stronger than the rest of society and give something back. There was a man from Tusla who grew tomatoes in, in, a, in a greenhouse that we gave him. And he said that although he had lost his leg, he thought his life was over, but the day that he walked into an orphanage with three boxes of beautiful tomatoes and gave them to the children, he said was the proudest day of his life, the greatest day of his life. And this is after losing his leg. So he was fully recovered. He, he was brought all the way back. Foreign policy can't do that. Only personal commitment, personal person-to-person -person connection can do that. And only people <coughs> can do it for themselves in partnership. It's not from us to them. Now, when I went into government uh, in the State Department, the President and Secretary of State put me in charge of the landmine policy because they knew I was working with landmine survivors. So we managed to have partnerships with uh, 50 non-government organizations including uh, Gergic Hills, the great Croatian-American vineyard in Napa Valley. Uh, I'm a tennis, a crazy tennis fan, so 
Uh, it was once at the U.S. Open where uh, our program had donated uh, some support to raising uh, funds for landmine removal and both the Federation Cup team of America and the Davis Cup team had donated their rackets and their sports clothes uh, to raise money for demining in Croatia, as it turns out. Um, and so I had the privilege of standing up at the US Open and with a big screen, and Colin Powell gave a video address and uh, put in a plug for landmines. Well, that's a soft power connection. It's a, it's, it, it's, it was in a sports context, it was athletes, doing something for humanity, reaching across to people in a place that was hosting them for tennis. So I'm glad the US government was able to facilitate it. But in the end, whenever we did a landmine project, and we did it in 42 countries to get rid of these dangerous landmines, we always said this is the gift of the American people. It's not the government, it's the, it's the American people. So I think landmines is one area where I became sensitized to the ability to help people through informal networks and not just by government policy. When people are suffering the most, they will always remember who came to help. And we've seen some incredibly uh, drastic tragedies. We saw the Banda Aceh uh, tsunami. There's been some really serious uh, impacts, including in Japan with Fukushima and all over the world, including in our country of Puerto Rico. Uh, New Orleans. So there have been some very serious crises, and, and that's when we have to remember uh, that people are in the greatest need. That's the moment where you have to reach out the most. It's more important than day-to-day -day policy. Foreign assistance is really, we sometimes forget, because there's lobbying and there's earmarks and the money just goes to the same old people and it doesn't reach the people in need. Foreign assistance has to be about helping people to, to reach their aspirations, particularly those people in need. And finally, I just, I hope you don't mind, but I don't get to show these pictures very often, but one of the lessons I learned was about music with a message and the power of art. That's a picture of a band called Coalition of the Willing. They've only played about 14 times over the years since 2004. The guy up front on the left is the former, was the ambassador of Hungary to the United States. When he was a teenager, he was behind the Iron Curtain, a soldier of the, of the uh, Warsaw Pact. But he used to listen at night <coughs> to the forbidden music from Radio Luxembourg, and he idolized British rock, the band uh, Traffic, Stevie Winwood. And he met them one night by staying up all night when they came into Budapest. Years later, when Andras Shimoni came to America, he was determined to form a band. He knew that I had a, a background in this music, me way in the background as a singer and a bass player. And I said, no, I'll never do that again. That's for young people. But then it turned out that the guy up front with the, with the beret is uh, Jeffrey Skunk Baxter of Steely Dan and the Doobie Brothers. He's a world-class musician. You don't say no to someone at that level. Uh, and he's brilliant. And he's also a wonderful guy. So the band formed, uh, and this is at the House of Blues in Cleveland, raising money for the victims of Katrina. So I'll just show you you know, different, that's a, up in a club in New York, different places. And the point is that it, it really was not about just the music. That's the 930 Club in Washington, D.C. It is a lot of fun, but it's not all for fun. There's a connection. There's a connection to national security. So there you see President George H.W. Bush. We helped raise funds to preserve the coastline of Maine against intrusion. That's the drummer. Sandy Vershbaugh was the ambassador to Russia when he was playing drums in a nightclub in New York. And he's being interviewed by Russian television. Talk about soft power, um, having the US ambassador on stage playing rock. The next one is Tony Blinken. That was in 2016, playing, standing in at the British ambassador's residence, deputy secretary of state. Uh, and on and on, you see Brent Scowcroft. You see, that's Frank Carlucci, the former secretary of defense, one of my favorite mentors great man and his wife, Marsha, at a, a fundraiser for their school. And I think around the corner, you see me talking with Tony Lake, who was national security advisor to President Clinton. He was at the, the knitting factory in New York. So there is a, uh, an interesting connection that, that happened here, where people of substance who are serious about national security, and by the way, Dan Poneman on the far right just stepped down as deputy secretary of energy. And it, previous to that, he was a non-proliferation advisor in the White House. So, 
people have two sides to their lives, of course, but, uh, but the soft power of this was a message. It said, never mind communism, freedom, East, West, this music connected our generation. That was the message. And actually there's a book that Andras will tell his story. The Stratocaster is more powerful than the Kalashnikov, so we'll be looking for that. It's a real book. And philanthropy, of course, was the other piece of this. At the, at, uh, in Cleveland, we raised funds for the victims of Katrina, the musicians who were turned out, who lost their, their homes in New Orleans at the House of Blues. And the, somewhere in that picture is the head of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And here is finally, I think, this one I think is the most important. That's Walter Reed, where soon after <coughs> the Iraq intervention, there were wounded warriors who could not even come out in front and watch this band. They were on gurneys just outside the door to the entrance to their wing of the hospital. Nord Nordy Schwartz was a joint staff general. He soon went on to get a fourth star and be the chief of staff of the United States Air Force, introducing this band. Um, this broadcast was shown on Armed Forces Network all over the world, so military families could see. What could they see? They saw that music that there were people committed who cared about wounded warriors, and that the military and the rock and rollers and the ambassadors and, and whatnot were all one team. And that I can't tell you if the music was good or bad, we tried our best. But there was a great Hungarian buffet, all put on by the Hungarian embassy. And some of these guys were so badly wounded, they, could, they just wanted to hear the vibration of the sound. That's all they could appreciate, but they wanted to be part of it. So very, uh, well, you get the idea. This is the magic of soft power. So as we look forward, <coughs> there's a larger point here. What direction is the world going? Things are changing very fast. It's a younger world. There's a wave of youth. They're using in technology in ways that my generation has never done. There's a lot going on that we have to understand. So what is at stake here? And the question is, can the people's aspirations be satisfied? If there is no freedom, you're looking at some of the, if you will, autocratic rulers on the left-hand side. Uh, and there are the demonstrations in Hong Kong. They didn't want the ballot to be controlled by Beijing uh, a couple of years ago. So the question for me is, where does the United States stand? We're, we're concerned about a lot of things. One is what Alan Larson mentioned, the interference in our domestic politics and false social media coming from foreign powers. And so the question for us is, are we going to copy this? Is, is we going to start doing the same thing and putting false media to other places? What, it's sort of like when someone poisons your water supply, do you add more poison? When someone blows up satellites in space, do you double the degree by blowing up their satellite? This is where I think we have to remember what's at stake and, and what matters and what direction is the right direction. Uh, the question is whether the United States will stand for truth and integrity in the information domain. As you've heard already, I'll show the pictures you've heard from Alan, who is such an expert on these matters, but our prosperity is threatened by corruption and illicit commerce. And the money from some of that goes to uh, terrorist and criminal groups. I had the privilege of chairing a think tank the last eight years. I stepped down recently. The Simpson Center, it's a nonpartisan think tank, which studied in one case, was working with the counter-poaching forces in southern Kenya where the rhinos are being exterminated for their horns very quickly. The money from that, ex from that poaching goes to al-Shabaab and to criminal networks. And, and, and it corrupts government officials, people working in ports and, and uh, customs officials. And it robs governments of tax revenues, which they need so that uh, in places like Cambodia, um, there's enough money so that the government can pay its police and the police don't have to you ask for money every time they do something for a citizen, which is so degrading and so negative. So, so we worry about this, wh whether we will work with the advanced economies to promote good governance. And we have to ask, what about the impacts of climate change? Of course, if you're watching uh, the United States debate, you know that some people are debating the causes of climate change, even though there's a, a, a large scientific community that does not think it's debatable. But nobody can dispute the fact that the temperatures are rising. I'm involved with oceanographers in a project as well to, to put more, get more data from the ocean. But the effects of global warming are real. And, and there are a lot of displaced populations. There are a lot of coastal areas at threat. The severity of, of natural um, events, natural catastrophe, 
has the U.S. military uh, planning for much more uh, response as an emergency responder than they would have before. So there are a lot of traditional tools of influence, military force, diplomacy, foreign aid. I mentioned information. Information is possibly the most powerful of them all. Look, uh, there are a lot of discussions in the United States about the war in Vietnam. We had used an, an immense amount of combat power. Look at the result. You had a, a much less sophisticated force, but they, they resisted. And this has been true in a lot of interventions, not all, but we found in Iraq when there was great resistance, it was very frustrating. This wasn't just two armies uh, playing, uh, having a traditional uh, contest on, on, in military terms. Warfare has changed. What people think, what people stand for, what people care about, who they trust, is absolutely vital. And that, that really is the area where the United States has to focus. Uh, a century ago, <coughs> ideology became the most powerful organizing principle. We, we saw the rise of perhaps the most dangerous movements in, in history, whether communism and fascism, and with, with immense amounts of industrial organizational power behind these, these movements and caused the most destructive wars in our history. Today, I would say that identity and belief are now, once again, very potent, uh, thanks to cell phones everywhere, thanks to the internet, and thanks to the creativity of people who now have a voice that reaches outward. So I'm going to conclude, I'm going to say in this, in this world, this chaotic world, I don't think it's impossible to understand, but things are changing. Where you have rival powers competing for influence, you have forces that are trying to disrupt and destroy the stable world order, you have, uh, you have the United States asking itself a question. And a lot of people who have always thought they understood America are asking a question. What does America stand for? Is the United States still a champion for common hopes and aspirations? Not the only champion, but does the United States stand with people who care about the future and want a prosperous and, and open and, and a peaceful world? And the answer can really no longer be delivered simply by military forces, or even by diplomats who are received at the highest levels. You see them on TV walking into the palace, and they have these fancy meetings and dinners with flower arrangements in the middle. That's not, that's not the answer. It's part of the answer, but it's not the answer. Nor can you write a check and simply say, hey, we've, we've, we've pledged you know, a billion dollars. There was a pledging conference in Kuwait the other day. $30 billion in loans and loan guarantees from different countries to rebuild Iraq. Yeah, that's important, but it was a one-day story. It didn't really change what people are, are animated about in the, in the conflicts in the Levant. So I would say that people everywhere are connected to my country by its culture. <clears throat> they see its fierce political debates. They see the disputes about the credibility of news organizations, the fake news issue, controversies about sexual misbehavior, the availability of guns. This is all being done in, a, in, in the full view of anyone who cares to tune in around the world. And I, I'm always so astonished at how closely people in many countries follow these issues, even behind you know, repressive dictatorships. It's amazing to me. And they're connected to Americans through music, through movies, through sports, literature, and even, not even, but maybe most of all, through social media posts. For lack of a better term, puppy videos. <laughs> There's a lot of that. So more than ever before, I would say that my country, Americans, need to remember that our values, our civic traditions, in other words, what was the whole idea behind the Republic and the Constitution? What was the central organizing idea? If you go back to the Declaration of Independence, it really was about one country, one nation, um, which I'm not sure that young people are hearing that anymore, even inside this country. So the message is getting a bit blurred. They know that America always stood for the future, our love of innovation. And I hope you all saw the picture, I didn't put it in here, I should have, uh, of, of the rocket that Elon Musk sent into space with the Tesla Roadster and, the, the, uh, and that picture of the Earth behind. That was an extremely evocative photograph. 
and he obviously knew that it would, it would inspire everyone's imagination. That's what America has stood for in the past. And they know that Americans in the past have shown generosity and basic goodness. Those were the things that Americans thought connected us to people everywhere. Now, in this very fractured world, every American has to be a small a ambassador. Every American, in every dealing, has to remember who they are. And frankly, together, once this country remembers who we are and what we stand for in the world, I think there will be a lot of goodwill and common ground with people around the world who want nothing more and nothing less than what Americans have, which is the freedom to fulfill our own human potential. That is what every person wants. And that's the geopolitical challenge for this century. Sounds easy. It's easy to say it. We all know it's not easy. But you came today because you know that that, that culture, that connecting on a human level, that relating and developing trust person to person, that that is the key to a much brighter future. So let me stop there, and I'll be, I welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you.